November 13th, 2020. Wacker Polysilicon, North America, in Charleston, Tennessee. One worker was killed and two others were seriously injured when attempting to escape a hydrogen chloride gas release. An additional worker was injured from exposure to the hazardous hydrogen chloride. This tragic incident was completely preventable. The CSB's report identifies several critical issues that must be addressed to ensure safe operations. Those include the need for written procedures, control of hazardous energy, greater guidance on simultaneous operations, and improved means of egress. Wacker's Charleston, Tennessee facility manufactures various silicon-based materials that are used in the production of a variety of products. On November 2nd, 2020, the company initiated a two-week turnaround of its hydrogen chloride regeneration unit to perform routine maintenance as well as equipment upgrades and repairs. To assist with the turnaround, Wacker employed contract workers from multiple companies, including Jake Marshall and Penn Golf. On the morning of November 13th, Wacker issued a work permit to Jake Marshall to perform maintenance on a heat exchanger's vapor outlet piping. The work was to be done while hydrogen chloride was actively flowing through the piping. Exposure to hydrogen chloride gas can cause injuries ranging from irritation of the eyes and lungs to severe burns or death. To protect themselves from those chemical hazards, the Jake Marshall contractors wore full-body chemical-resistant suits, rubber boots and gloves, and full-face respirators with acid gas cartridges. The maintenance took place on the fifth floor of an equipment access structure, which only had one staircase for entry and exit. That morning, contractors from Penn Golf were also working on the same fifth floor platform. The Penn Golf employees, however, were performing insulation activities that were not expected to involve potential exposure to hydrogen chloride. For their insulation work, the four Penn Golf contractors were wearing the minimum personal protective equipment required by Wacker. Flame-resistant clothing, steel toe safety boots, as well as safety glasses and hard hats. They had escape respirators and safety harnesses in their possession, but were not actively wearing those items. The Jake Marshall contractor's task was to tighten bolts on the heat exchanger's vapor outlet piping in order to minimize leaks. The amount of force required to tighten a bolt is based in part on the materials of construction of the equipment being connected. The amount of force is called the torque requirement. The vapor outlet piping included both a nozzle made of graphite and lined piping constructed of carbon steel. In this case, the torque requirement for bolts connecting steel to steel is higher than the torque requirement for bolts connecting steel to graphite, as graphite is a very brittle material. But on the day of the incident, Jake Marshall pipe fitters were not given written specifications for every bolt they would tighten. A Jake Marshall journeyman provided an apprentice pipe fitter with a torque wrench set to 40 foot-pounds, which is the setting for tightening the steel-to-steel -steel connections. After tightening the bolts requiring 40 foot-pounds of torque, the pipe fitter then used the torque wrench to tighten bolts on the steel-to-graphite connection. But the manufacturer recommended torque value for those bolts is only 15 foot-pounds. As a result, the bolts were inadvertently over-tightened. At 10.04 a.m., the excess torque applied to those bolts caused the heat exchanger to crack. Hazardous hydrogen chloride released to the atmosphere between the workers and the only available staircase. Within 15 seconds, a large hydrogen chloride cloud filled the area, preventing the workers on the platform from seeing their surroundings. The apprentice pipe fitter quickly moved away from the release. As he did, his chemical suit became entangled on surrounding equipment and tore open. This exposed him to hydrogen chloride, which caused chemical burns. In the chaos, he bumped into equipment on the platform, which knocked off his respirator. Although he was located closest to the staircase, without a respirator, he could not pass through the hazardous cloud to exit. 
Instead, he moved to the opposite side of the platform where the other contractors had been working. Three of the four Penn Gulf employees put on their escape respirators. But without chemical suits, they were unable to walk through the cloud to reach the staircase located on the opposite side of the platform. Instead, they attempted to climb down piping on the side of the structure, which was approximately 70 feet high. While climbing down, all three fell to the ground. One worker was fatally injured from the fall, and two sustained serious injuries. The remaining Penn Gulf worker was able to put on her escape respirator with help from a Jake Marshall worker, who wearing chemical resistant PPE also attempted to shield her from the hazardous hydrogen chloride. The dangerous release continued for approximately three minutes until all the gaseous hydrogen chloride had escaped from the system. After the release stopped, the three Jake Marshall workers and one Penn Gulf worker used the staircase to evacuate the area and safely reach the ground. The Chemical Safety Board launched an investigation and found four key safety issues contributed to the incident. They are written procedures, control of hazardous energy, simultaneous operations, and means of egress. The first safety issue concerns written procedures. OSHA's Process Safety Management Standard and the EPA's Risk Management Plan rule required Vocker to implement written operating and maintenance procedures for covered processes and equipment. These should have included clear instructions for how to tighten the different types of connections present on the heat exchanger's vapor outlet piping. But the CSB found that Vocker did not have a written procedure to execute the task. Instead, Vocker relied on verbal instructions and the piping manufacturer's equipment manual to communicate the torque requirements to the Jake Marshall contractors. The manual, however, did not include the torque requirements for the bolts that were eventually over-tightened. Those requirements were included in the manufacturer's drawing of the heat exchanger, which the Jake Marshall pipe fitters did not have in their possession at the time of the work. The CSB learned that the correct torque requirements were verbally communicated by the Vocker permit authorizer to the Jake Marshall foreman. The foreman then relayed the torque requirements to the journeyman pipe fitter, who finally communicated the information to the apprentice, who ultimately tightened the bolts. But the lack of clear written information and reliance on verbal instructions increased the likelihood of miscommunication and misunderstanding of the task and precautions. Written procedures, which consolidate information required to safely execute a given task into easy to understand instructions, are a critical tool for ensuring safe operations and maintenance activities. Had Vocker used all relevant sources of information to develop written procedures for tightening each type of connection on the vapor outlet piping, it is likely that the contractors would have known about the specific torque requirements, which would have prevented this incident. As a result, the CSB recommended that Vocker Polysilicon develop detailed maintenance procedures for torquing activities. The second safety issue identified by the CSB is control of hazardous energy. The CSB found that Vocker had procedures in place for performing work on equipment that contained hazardous energy, such as pressurized chemicals. These procedures included safety precautions, such as developing an energy isolation plan, wearing PPE, and barricading the area to prevent access by workers not involved in the operation. But even though the heat exchanger vapor outlet piping contained pressurized hazardous chemicals, the company did not apply those procedures to the torquing operation. That is because the torquing operation did not involve the intentional opening of the process equipment. As a result, Vocker did not develop an energy isolation plan, nor did they perform a risk analysis to determine whether the torquing could be safely performed on equipment in operation. Also, Vocker did not barricade the area to prevent other workers, such as the Penn Gulf insulation team, from being in the area when the work occurred. Companies and workers should always assess and address the risk of performing maintenance on equipment containing hazardous materials not only when they plan to intentionally open piping or equipment, but also when equipment could be unintentionally opened, like what happened at Vocker when workers inadvertently damaged fragile graphite equipment.
Had Vokker adequately assessed the risk, they could have identified several ways to either prevent the incident or lessen its severity, such as through energy isolation, PPE requirements, or by restricting non-essential personnel from the work area. Therefore, the CSB recommended that Vokker develop policy requirements to ensure that torquing activities performed on equipment containing hazardous energy are performed safely and document these requirements in procedures. The third safety issue discovered by the CSB is simultaneous operations. Simultaneous operations, or SIMOPS, is defined as a situation in which two or more operations occur together at the same time and place. The simultaneous work performed by Jake Marshall and Pengolf personnel on the platform was a type of SIMOPS. The CSB found that Vocker did not have a policy or procedure for evaluating SIMOPS. Such a policy would require a hazard assessment to identify risks introduced by the simultaneous work. Instead, Vokker did not perform a hazard assessment and allowed the four Penn Gulf workers to be on the fifth floor platform without chemical protective PPE, while the more hazardous torquing work was also occurring. Ultimately, the four Penn Gulf workers were unnecessarily exposed to the hydrogen chloride release, causing three of them to take drastic actions to escape. Companies should always consider how SIMOPS could impact workers and operations. SIMOPS should be identified and controlled by conducting a hazard assessment before starting work, and steps should be taken to prevent any hazardous interactions. As a result, the CSB recommended that Vokker develop and implement a formalized SIMOPS program addressing co-located work tasks. The CSB also determined that industry guidance regarding SIMOPS has largely been restricted to offshore processing, such as oil and gas drilling. In fact, during its investigation, the CSB was unable to identify any codes, standards, or regulations specifically relating to the identification and control of SIMOPS for maintenance activities conducted on stationary source chemical processes. The CSB has investigated at least five other incidents involving SIMOPS, all of which led to the injuries or deaths of individuals not involved in the event that started the incident. To prevent other needless tragedies, the CSB believes that the lack of regulation and guidance surrounding SIMOPS is a safety gap that must be rectified. In its report, the CSB recommended that OSHA promulgate a standard or modify existing standards to require employers to ensure the coordination of SIMOPS involving multiple work groups, including contractors. The agency also recommended that the Center for Chemical Process Safety develop and publish a safety product on safe work practices, including detailed and practical guidelines for evaluating SIMOPS. Finally, the last safety issue identified by the CSB is means of egress. The CSB learned that Vokker performed a process hazard analysis three months before the incident, which identified the need for a ladder or some additional means of egress on the equipment access structure in case a hydrogen chloride release blocked workers from accessing the stairs. Prior to the incident, multiple employees also discussed concerns with Vokker management on the need for a secondary exit on the structure. But the CSB found that Vokker did not take any action to address these concerns before the incident. The CSB interviews with Vokker employees indicated a perception among the workers that management deferred employee concerns because Vokker management understood the building to be designed per code. As a result, seven workers were present on the fifth floor platform during the toxic release, with blocked stairs as the only point of egress. While building codes are an important foundation in design, they do not necessarily consider the specific hazards posed by a given process. Companies should prioritize the implementation of PHA findings and employee input to control hazards identified by those closest and most familiar with the facility and operations. The CSB learned that Vokker designed the equipment access structure with a single point of egress based on building code requirements for an unoccupiable equipment platform and were not required to add an additional means of egress. 
But these codes do not address scenarios like the ones at Vokker, where elevated equipment platforms are used for accessing equipment containing materials that pose physical and health hazards. The absence of regulatory guidance and standards on means of egress from open-air industrial structures directly contributed to the severity of this incident, and we believe companies need stronger guidance on this issue. Our investigation found that it has been nearly 50 years since another safety organization, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, or NIOSH, issued a publication describing these gaps in guidance for worker egress from elevated workstations. NIOSH had called for specific codes and standards to address these egress issues in 1975, but these concerns have not yet been addressed. Therefore, the CSB made recommendations to the International Code Council and the National Fire Protection Association to amend their codes to address conditions that may require multiple means of egress from elevated equipment platforms used for accessing equipment containing materials that pose physical and health hazards. What should have been straightforward maintenance by two separate groups of workers turned deadly because of several serious safety issues. The CSB believes that our findings and recommendations will address the issues found at Fokker and prevent another needless tragedy. Thank you for watching this CSB safety video. For more information, please visit csb.gov.